we have been enjoying from yesterday. So, Dr. Mahesh Shanmugam and his team have put together a wonderful scientific feast for all of us next two and a half days. So, I'll hand over the mic to the scientific team led by Pradeep. And thank you and enjoy the two and a half days of scientific feast and the social interaction. Thank you. I would, this session is all about choroid. So, like, I would like to welcome the vice council of this uh, session. And know that none of them need any introduction. I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Dr. Giridhar, kindly take the stage. Dr. Vaishali Gupta, Dr. Karobi Lahiri, Dr. George. Dr. Shobha Shobhaprasad. Yes, Dr. Shobha Shobhaprasad, take over the stage. Dr. Jay will be joining us virtually. So we are set to go. I would request Dr. Jay Chablani to deliver. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for this kind of invitation. I know it's uh, the first session and the first talk of the day. Uh, I'm glad that I'm not able to <laughs> Uh, see how many audience are there, but I'm I'm sure that who are, are there, they are truly interested uh, in the choroid session. Uh, uh, I really I really miss being there in person. I know that this RSI is happening after two years uh, in person. I hope to join in person next year. So be, without wasting much time, uh, let's start talking about chronic CSC management beyond drugs or laser. When I got this topic, I was like, okay, what should I speak? I figured that uh, this topic was given to me with a, with a reason, so I, I will try to do the justice, and I would love to hear the input from you all. Uh, before we really jump on to the actual topic, these are my financial, one very significant in presentation is salutaris because I'm going to discuss uh, one of the approaches using the device which salutaris uh, has developed, and we will be talking more about that and to uh, uh, to get everybody's attention that the part which I'm presenting we have filed the global patent and I'm the inventor for uh, uh, that patent uh, before I really get on to this I know that, uh, that the talk is going to be very different and I really look I, I wish I was there to see everybody's reaction but I do not have any experience with the treatment options which I will be discussing and these are just different approaches or hypotheses which I feel that we should be exploring, uh, particularly uh, for central serous. Uh, we understand that whatever we discuss needs to be further evaluated much more uh, in detail in terms of doing clinical trials, then we will be able to apply in the clinical practice. But I tried to do the justice to the topic that is going beyond uh, laser and uh, oral treatment. So before we really get on to talking what else can we do, we all know that we have various treatment options available ranging from focal continuous wave, that is con conventional laser. We all have been very um, much using PDT, but now unfortunately many places in India, the PDT dye is not available. We have done subthreshold laser, we are still doing it. And we all have uh, used various kinds of oral medication, rifampicin, and there is some literature supporting intravitreal metoprolol as well. And the surgical approach has also been explored, scleral windows uh, for uh, chronic CSC, particularly in today's day where we are believing that it is uh, primary uh, venous uh, overload cardiopathy. But uh, we know that these approaches have limited benefits. There are failures, resistance, and many of these patients suffer terribly, especially uh, you can see them losing vision. And unfortunately, we have almost nothing uh, to offer them. 
So where do we go beyond these treatment options? Let's talk about how about using brachytherapy uh, for central serous patients. Before I really get on to how do we want to use it, I would like to introduce a new device which has developed by Salutaris, uh, which is primarily an episcleral brachytherapy device. We recently published our uh, two-year treatment, uh, two-year data of application of this episcleral brachytherapy for treatment resistant wet AMD, and we had uh, very promising results. We have just submitted our PCV trial proposal to FDA, and we are looking forward to start this uh, trial for PCV. But as you all can imagine, I, I kept thinking that can we actually use this uh, into CSCR? But let's look at this video first, and we can understand how this device works. The SMDDA system consists of a single use applicator and reusable radiation source, which are assembled in the operating room. In the operating room, the patient receives local anesthetic, and the surgeon makes a small incision in the conjunctiva. The SMDDA is guided through the incision between the extraocular muscles to the back of the eye, leaving the globe of the eye and the eyelid undisturbed. Transillumination allows the surgeon to position the device over the target area. The light source can be adjusted to correct for individual patient variations. The SMDDA is held in position for a prescribed dwell time. Typically, this is five minutes. Following the dose delivery, the SMDDA is completely removed. No radiation remains in the patient. The SMDDA is disassembled. The applicator is discarded, and the source is cleaned for future use. The patient is released from the outpatient center the same day. Salutaris MD. So while, work, while looking at this device, uh, I was trying to explore that what is the impact of this episcleral low uh, radiotherapy uh, on choroidal vessels. And then in collaboration with a radiation oncologist from Sun, we worked out uh, a, a dosing uh, approach for these central serous. And here you can see that how we can uh, understand what is the dose we are going to in the large choroidal blood vessels, and he clearly explains to you that the actual dose in the part of the choroid is somewhere going to be in the range of 8 to 10 um, grades, which is far less than uh, what we usually do for other uh, tumors, which, was, which is what uh, uh, helps us particularly in patients with uh, central serous. So we believe that low-dose radiation can induce centimal proliferation in these large choroidal vessels, which would eventually uh, help to reduce their hyperpermeability, and that can actually help some of uh, our refractive cases of central serous. And this year, we published uh, this hypothesis uh, in, um, uh, in 2022, where we tried to show how it, is, it could be useful in central serous. And this is the patent which we have filed, and this is just the US patent. We have filed this into the global um, uh, market. Uh, the next interesting therapy, which I feel we should explore further is medical marijuana, because we all know that now medical marijuana is very much uh, applicable in many fields, including cancer, uh, in terms of heart disease. This, this is being uh, very much prescribed, and these, this is the map which I show you which are, which are the states in the U.S. Uh, the medical marijuana is legally approved to be used uh, for medical reasons, and some of the states have also approved for recreational uh, use as well. This is a very complex uh, uh, medicine, which we need to learn a lot, but uh, I was looking at medical marijuana and eye indications, and you all will be surprised that the first study came 50 years ago where they showed that the medical marijuana can be used in lowering the intraocular pressure. And the reason being is that because you have C1 receptors which are present in ciliary epithelial and trabecular meshwork as well as in retinal neurons. And medical marijuana has been much more in field of glaucoma where they have showed that it can be used IOP lowering, uh, uh, as an IOP lowering agent. And a couple of clinical trials have shown mixed results. The mixed results primary reason is that it all depends upon the, the, the content of THC versus CBD. Unfortunately, because of the time limitation, I cannot uh, go into the detail about uh, how the THC and CBD can uh, show a different kind of uh, IOP response. 
but overall this has been used in eye indications and now there are studies going on in evaluating retinal neuron protection this this becomes another indication for glaucoma uh, unfortunately the dose this all effects or the benefits depend upon dose as well as the route of administration and there are various kinds of routes which are being explored for medical marijuana so i went ahead and looked into some of the um, uh, available mechanism which can actually help us eventually could be that uh, we all know that uh, dopamine can increase the vasodilation in the choroidal circulation this is a paper from ios back in 2004 which clearly showed that dopamine can increase the vascularity of choroidal vessels and uh, the cannabinoid receptor which is eb1 receptor yeah, by inhibiting this you can have a uh, 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 by by using the CB1 receptor, you can inhibit the dopamine release. So there is certainly uh, a, a way where we can uh, under, try to understand the complex relationship of uh, CB1 receptor and the amount of THC which might which we might have to uh, modulate. With this, I would like to conclude that these were pretty much exploratory therapies where I've been thinking about it and trying to understand uh, its application. We we do have some limited animal studies, particularly for the episcleral brachytherapy. Unfortunately, we do not have any clinical experience, uh, particularly for medical marijuana for CSCR. Uh, and we, we definitely need to understand the complex mechanism more, as well as to understand the ocular and systemic side effects. In addition to all this, we know that the CSR is a complex uh, disease considering the multifactorial and systemic association. And there are controversies in classifying CSR, and unfortunately, we still do not have any treatment protocols, and we have very limited treatment options considering the limited availability. So I would just like to say that we really need to think beyond the lifestyle modification and yoga or available treatment options for these patients. Thank you so much. I would like to acknowledge a couple of uh, funding agencies who have been supporting some of our work. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Dr. Jai, for that enlightening talk. This is all about the future, like what we sent to you about the future. Like of all this, like what do you think has a long way to go? Like one of this. I I would say, uh, Pradeep, I would think that uh, the brachytherapy can definitely have a role because uh, the way we have been looking at radiotherapy is, you know, we whenever we talk about radiotherapy, we always think about choroidal ischemia, uh, medium choroidal vessels dying, but just think about reducing the radiotherapy dose. We can actually try to save these leaky blood vessels and probably prevent uh, the leakage. And and as I said, that I don't have any clinical experience so far for, but this this seems to be fitting in somewhere. And as far as the medical marijuana is concerned, I think that uh, we are not far from using it for other eye conditions. And I think that. CSR also could be uh, one of the indications considering the way uh, the UVL tissue has been approached uh, using. Meantime, I would like uh, Dr. Nisha to take. Uh, this is about the future. Like, uh, I would like to request Dr. Gita to opine what would be a first line of management right now in the current era? What would be a first line of management for chronic CSR? Fortunately, as uh, Jai said, definition of self is complex. Have patient long standing macular detachment, RP atrophy, parietal choid change, that group. Uh, any form of treatment can give PDT harmful. But basically, I think if you get a reasonable chronic central uh, the Structural change not very advanced. Angiography, ICG, angiography, dilated choroidal with liquidity. A treatment prior to the pandemic, low fluid, anemic. That's a wonderful treatment. Works extremely well. Incidence of recurrence very low even after two follow up. Patients maintain reasonable, low complications. Select your patients, that will be my Regarding the availability that is available right now, 
wider public wide available options in known and the anti wedge epileron is not in my scheme i i, I do not know i personally has got very limited role in the management of very difficult to monitor requires very long term use and i do not know whether epileron works or whether it's a psycho therapy that is some sort of a placebo treatment so epileron is not in my scheme of micropulse is something that in our center selected patients with chronic central retinopathy again i don't think we are at a time when we can really tell you how the actual outcomes as well as pulses even today in chronic central center scoria retinopathy where they said the structural damage is not good extensive and fluorescein angiography is showing leaks i wouldn't mind giving laser especially i think yellow laser is harmless they end up quite far away not be a or a permanent maybe a response and come back with a it's one of the drawbacks of regulation available forms oral medications much that offer as of now as far as brachytherapy is concerned i was wondering why not try transpupil thermotherapy yeah. actually we, we have done uh, <laughs> so why not try a low dose transpupil uh, thermotherapy in brachytherapy you don't have to open the conjunctiva you don't have to push something like that of course so uh, tt a very adjusted dose probably may be an alternative treat in some case non exact but we have published some that act we have uh, compared low fluence speed as mentioned half half the threshold of uh, we have compared pd versus eplinaron it has a 90% success rate without any recurrence in the next two and uh, ttt almost same effect without the dye and uh, now we are doing uh, half dose pd we are doing since the last 6 months so be, but, but limited availability uh, of doing there pinaron has 20% success the, in the comparative trial we collaborated with jay also there so uh, 90% versus 20% so 20% whether it's placebo as uh, dr girdar was mentioning or is it uh, really effective i don't know uh, even marijuana may another j one, one more mechanism is that it may take care of the type 1 personality also yes yeah. shot up to and my on birth the cbo did better so eplanon is definitely not a treat so brachytherapy for my time an ophthalmologist had already done for am and we had the same brachytherapy done very all have flopped today so i unfortunately they i do not have any that that's going to work i do be photos sufficient can i have thank you jai thank you we have thank dr shukla slides yeah uh, so my first slide i'll uh, like to talk about it so that it doesn't come into the time before we discuss the pachycora disease we must acknowledge the pachyderm in the room even though virtually that's my friend jay chavlani and i congratulate him on my behalf and behalf of all of us for completing 500 publications in pubmed recently congratulations and god bless jay thank you thank you so much sir you were the real motivation <laughs> for last 10 years thank you request the slides i can start without the slides if you don't mind so uh, basically i am asked to discuss that uh, what how do we treat acute csc differently today so uh, since the time is short you know the simple answer is we do it as we did before don't treat acute csc even today so that's a you know a one second um, explanation of the entire presentation but i'll go into details get this one
up like a show of hands from the audience like for chronic csc like how many would consider epirino micropulse correct yeah yeah so uh, can you stop the slides they are they're running on their own actually so before we discuss uh, what is csc we should know what is acute csc so uh, we generally take something as acute when it has a short history but we know that patient history is unreliable is the clinical appearance a clue yes sometimes but it can be very deceptive i'm going to tell you the patient age sex is actually more an indicator of typical versus atypical csc not acute versus chronic as jn colleagues uh, told us you should keep it simple he said that if you or even others have said before even gas told us before if you have a large area of rp atrophy then you should call it complex or chronic and if it is less uh, then uh, no it is not a minimal area of rp atrophy no rp atrophy should call it acute or simple So recently, JN colleagues specified that areas less than two inches diameters. Besides that, you should have your patient in the typical age, uh, young or middle aged. If you have a patient who is seven years old or seventy year olds, obviously think of something else. These patients typically show one to two focal leaks, RP level leaks. On uh, the slides are running off. Uh, just stop them. So uh, and the retina, neurosensory retina should be healthy. most importantly this is by definition a disease which resolves within 2 to 3 months but it lasts more than 4 months we call it persistent if more than 6 months we call it chronic so typical csc should be a uh, simple diagnosis like a smoke stack or focal leak as we see here but sometimes it's not sometimes you do not see the typical smoke stack or focal leak and if you do oct in some of these cases it tells us that we are dealing with something else which requires a surgical treatment as a case of optic pit maculopathy in this patient before we even discuss csc we should first mention the history the type a personality in steroids are a given but we sometimes forget to know how many ways patient can take steroids and i mean if the patient is, has asthma skin allergies arthritis or common cold or is on uh, contraceptive pills even some ayurvedic treatment contains steroids and recently my friend has shown that even fairness creams in some patients you know especially in south india they uh, can cause cscr and recently viagra has been implicated as well so beware sugar daddies so what are the key investigations beside the fundus examination oct shows us you know the serous detachment which is the key finding but also more importantly it shows us the pachycoroid that is the thickened choroid in the fellow eye so always look at the fellow eye fluorescein shows us the nature of leaks that is uh, their focal and uh, autofluorescence when available confirms the rp atrophy very clearly octa and icg have less significance for acute csc so coming to the moot question which was given to me uh, how do we treat acute csc today my answer is a counter question are we asking the wrong question because should we treat acute csc at all the answer remains no uh, on the current literature and personal experience remember that is the default presentation of csc only 5 to 15% of cases go on to develop chronic csc we are we discuss treat we should first do no harm remove the predisposing factors remember that it is a self limiting disease or treatment has to be perfect which we not have as jas presentation has just highlighted when do we consider treatment we consider treatment when the disease last long how long as i have shown it there is no uh, criterion but minimal 3 to 6 months it's an old patient because the rp pump is not that healthy the patient requires an early rehab like a airline pilot or if it's a large attachment with a low acuity choroid is very thick let us more than 500 microns there is a large pd or there is an area of geographic atrophy in other words the chronic changes are already present or begin so how do we treat when we actually treat them so as uh, george has shown actually we have a very good experience with transpupillary thermotherapy both myself and george george uses even less uh, uh, intensity than me and uh, both of us have shown good results actually in uh, uh, publications earlier as we know we are coming back in full circle and pdt half dose probably is the gold star treatment though it is not available sub threshold micropulse laser or pdt can be tried in sub foveal leaks and conventional laser obviously in the extra foveal leak sum up 
uh, we do not still treat acute CSE, but we know more about it. We know that acute to chronic CSE is a continuum and there are 50 shades of gray in between, but the extremes of this continuum are clearly visible. You need uh, uh, OCT to diagnose the pachycoroid and uh, FAF or autophoresis to diagnose the RP atrophy. We should prefer treatment after three to four months, even if the changes are not present. PDT is the preferred treatment when needed and available, and pharmacotherapy has no uh, role in acute CSE. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dhananjay Shukla, for this crisp talk. I would like to request uh, to opine, like, how long would you observe a case of uh, C? How long you wait until you want to do C? I think Dhananjay already since and I agree. But I would also like to add about the... So when a patient with acute palm, you know it's acute. Really don't eat all the ICD and all the uh, and you because what you keep on doing for stress you induce so if you know it's acute you see I will not uh, avoid I would avoid unnecessary image the second thing is about when it becomes chronic Becky I agree will try the 90 and you know brachytherapy and not work but scleral thing what we have been started to Recently, to look if it falls into the spectrum of the followed choroidopathy, look at the near scleral thing. If sclera is the quadrant where the ampulla is dilated and you have in ampullary NS causes scleral windows work sometimes. But that is not acute. That is yeah, for the yeah, exactly because for that you require an yellow based white field or uh, 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 yeah. the Right optos ICG, not not without that. PTT is amazing. Uh, well, marijuana may work in the acute, but I will not use marijuana. Oh. Why is what is job concern? Yeah, uh, so it depends on the location of leak. The subfovial leak, I'll be wary of treatment actually. And I would try one of these fancy stuff like uh, even, uh, you know, by the way, uh, uh, many of us, I mean, uh, Dr. Shova Shapra is the first author that study in the Lancet actually. So, uh, again, uh, but I have read all the reviews of uh, the studies and people say, yes, you might consider epilinone sometimes. Uh, uh, it, so it's like, a, you know, it's like a placebo for yourself and the patient. Actually. So uh, uh, I would simply, if it is extra foveal leak, yes, I can treat with laser. And actually, there's a study by Dr. Neha in recently in IGO which showed that even regular laser, if you apply in a sub-threshold manner, that doesn't cause much changes in the even micro perimetry. That's a something which everybody can do actually. Uh, so there are several options for sub foveal leaks. I'll probably wait till at least uh, four to six. Out of time, Dr. Sharma to take which I request the AV team to. The slides. Uh, once it's ready, like the other side of the stage, or Thank you, VRSI, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, in the next uh, five to six minutes, uh, I would be talking about the myths and truths related to anti vegf biosimilars. We have been uh, trying to understand biosimilars since last three to four years. And before I proceed further, these are my financial disclosures. And this is our contribution in terms of uh, you know, understanding and publishing various aspects of uh, biosimilars, whatever we could learn. And I would definitely like to acknowledge all these people were really, really for understanding all these uh, important areas. So we know, means at, at least in India, we are quite aware that what exactly biosimilars are. These company need to make sure through the trial that they are safe, pure, and potent, as good as the innovator molecule. 
but they cannot be exact same molecule because it's a you know live cell which cannot be similar and they are not chemical molecules so you do tolerate some kind of differences but you need to make sure that they are not clinically meaningful so I would like to you know uh, explain here because I was part of multiple talks multiple debates uh, in European society and American society in last couple of years so there were some myths which is still going around it and as a country you know most matured nation as far as biosimilar ranibuzumab is concerned we would like to clarify some of the myths whenever we speak on these forum the first question or first comment which comes during the discussion is you had one ranibuzumab biosimilar in 2015 which had mild anterior inflammation in initial few batches so that's where your negative perception starts but now you look at you have two more biosimilars one from leukin one from lines did you get any report of any inflammation no and after 2015 initial batches even in task did not report an inflammation so just go back just go back to lucentis which is a parent molecule and the reference molecule look at the phase 3 data of anchor in marina Anchor had inflammation in 17.1% of cases. Marina had inflammation in 20.9% of cases. But do you see that inflammation now? No. Now, even if you see the BioWaze, which was a molecule SB11 in the phase 3 trial, which got approval by FDA and EMA, had no significant inflammation. Why was that? If you really look at 2015 and before, most of the companies were following ISO limit. They were following ISO recommendation of endotoxin, which was less than 0.5 EU per ml. And that was pretty all right for majority of the cases. But over the time, when you know you have more therapies coming in, FDA realized that even at less than 0.5 E, there's a chance that some patients might get inflammation inflammation reaction. Then FDA further tightened it, and now the limit is less than 0.2 and means uh, in my collaboration with these companies now they are actually maintaining 0 0.08 which is pretty tight that's the reason that you do not have those kind of safety issues now second myth biosimilars are not tested well in clinical trials just look at the data of anchor and marina in anchor you had 140 patients in 0.5 milligram arm marina had 240 patients in 0.5 milligram arm but if you look at the data of ranibizumab nuna which got approved by fda and ema they had 354 patients in 0.5 milligram arm even if you club both anchor and marina that number is almost equal and another another myth is that the endpoints are short but there is a reason for short endpoint the clinical trial design is an equivalence design equivalence design means to have a margins where you have a BCPA margin you have CST margins that you can only show in the sweet spot when these drug they have highest efficacy in the beginning but these drugs although the endpoints are short but they are tested for their safety and efficacy throughout the 12 months period another myth they are extrapolated in terms of approval why because your reference molecule has not shown any kind of safety variation based on the indication if they would have shown any safety variation definitely regulatory would have asked for different trials and different indication so that is again a myth you see the experience from europe x europe is following the same equivalence design for non ophthalmology biosimilars and till date from 2006 there is no molecule has been withdrawn or suspended because safety and efficacy issues as far as india is concerned the we have three companies making it in TAS. I'm trying to clarify because sometimes you get confused at Oceva, Renei. So basically, three companies are manufactured companies in TAS, Lupin, Reliance. Lupin supplies to uh, Sun, which brands it at Oceva, so molecule is same. Reliance supplies to another company, but there are uh, means supply issues, so probably that molecule is not yet here now. If you really look at the global trials now as of now lupin is ahead because means i have a disclosure with lupin for this talk but still if you see the only company as of now which is in the process of a flibercert biosimilar is lupin and they're going to start their phase three next next few months so overall means education education and education that is what you need and 
If you have that education, many lives can become better with biosimilars. I can treat my father on regular injections because of these molecules, which I would have not done that even, you know, uh, innovative therapy because of the cost issues. Thank you so very much for giving the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Ashish Sharma, for that excellent talk. Like, uh, I would like to request Dr. Karobi Lahiri to find, like, uh, like, know that, like, biosimilars differ between batch to batch and lot to lot and even the innovator molecule. Whether we see any clinically significant difference in terms of efficacy from batch to batch in terms of biosimilar. Uh, to answer this question, I do not. I feel that a clone is always a clone. It doesn't have the properties. And uh, the way the trials are done, a reverse spirit. How you build up molecules, biosimilar, not ever have that. The reverse, the clinical. Don't have too much time. Quoted uh, to much less. My person, by some, I don't think I'm the right. The panelist. Question is whether we would, would use uh, a biosimilar or avastin. The question: uh, You have the originator molecule, multiple of them now. Then what would be your preference in a patient who is? Um, no, have to decide between Bastin or a biosim. Any difference? I just add one. When biosimilars came, many of us were very skeptical about. Okay, it's. I just have one question. You have an FDA approved drug, got a four percent chance of inoculin, got a rare possibility. Condition. Is a biosimilar not less risky? I mean, much safer than an FDA approved drug. Each time I suggest to a patient, there is an element of stress and tension. Me advising that particular, I use it, but then I know I'm taking that one to two percent risk, which they I do not have with a bio. Biosimilars have evolved over. Of time after the and are used. So I would give a choice to have the original molecule that would be the first choice. If not, then biosimilar. But we have had a good experience. Uh, I mean, started using biosimilar, definitely better than plastic. Unlike for uh, purposes, Dr. Sobab, if you permit, I have one question. So, means uh, uh, in UK system, they have means biosimilars coming in as a step therapy. Oh, it is a replacement. Then we are allowed to have for it, have right. fully percept our all of the energy, five percent. Time that just comes in. They are not worried about money in it. Right. So the choice, and of course, with recession, government is asking. Us. But I think India should be extremely proud. We are proud. We, we are, are definitely we are, I mean, proud. We are definitely proud. I I stand in front of the stage of Uretna AAO with extreme proud. The way we have done it now. So now we would be giving, you would see the kind of, you know, after three approvals of what it has done to the innovator pricing. It has brought down innovator pricing by 30%. Also, more than 30% excess patients excess, can be treated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something India needs and India created it. I think you should, all should be proud of it. Thank it, you for bringing also, that. Also, um, the one thing if I want to say negative about it is, I wish India did the randomized control trials. Absolutely, I, I I agree with that. Even now, I was talking to Dr. Mangat last time when we were meeting. Somehow means because we took a lead, we are in a driving position. Our trial design should be much stronger. Should be. It should go. And it should be symmetrical. It should not vary like you know, Reliance Ranibizumab has a different trial. 
it has to be symmetrical the way SB1 did it, the way FYB201 did it. Quite symmetrical trial, quite symmetrical endpoints. Ashish, one good trial and high impact. Actually, one, one trial is on the way in a, for the European Union approval. Same drug which we are talking it about. Should, it should go to a very good journal so that it can be so, all over. The so what happens, you know, for example, if you look at the lupin molecule, even if you look at the entire molecule, now they are, you know, having a trial for EMA approval and FDA approval. That is very well designed. But I would wonder that we sh could have just followed the same thing for India per se. Then we would be much more respected the globe not, and we are not yet losing the game right? yeah we are not yet losing the game so i was speaking to intas that you know you took a lead why are you not there in a flip no not only that run the clinical trial with the guy being an indian take on uh, don't run trials no molecule Please, i am one of the pi for lupin uh, flip no it's so not enough you have it's to not be enough the main yeah. bi have to have the trial design run by Indian, run by Indian, published by Indian. What you should do. Less of what you have already done. Thank you so much for all those efforts, Dr. Sova. Thanks I for. Would, I, would. I don't want to make a comment. I think we are again not addressing the elephant in the room. So that is Paginex. We are not afraid of inflammation. We are afraid of occlusive vasculitis. That's number one. Same thing we do not know in Paginex, when will the inflammation occur? You can have a you know, uh, complication free injections after a uh, third or fourth injection can have inflammation. That is what we are afraid of actually. Paginex is the drug we are most concerned about. Other biosimilars. Request the AV team to show the slides of Dr. Charu Gupta. Can I get a quick show of hands like after all this discussion, like how many still hesitate to give biosimilar random, biosimilar molecule? Uh, to summarize, like uh, basically, like we are all accepting the biosimilars. As everyone mentioned, like a good randomized control trial, the publication in a good journal, make it still more believable to everyone. Morning, everyone. Uh, I'll just speak on pachycoroid neovascular. So what? Why pachycoroid neovascular accounts for nearly 20 to 30 percent of all CNVM above the 50 years of age? It's important to diagnose and differentiate from neovascular AM because it's different from it phenotypically as well as genetically. VEGF levels are very different in the two groups. It has a variation in presentation, and it lies within the pachycoroid spectrum of disease continuum. So it's seen in younger age with a predilection for the male sex. Uh, you see hardly absent or no drus minimal drusence in the in the color photographs and uh, on the autofluorescence there's abnormal autofluorescence overlying the pachy vessels uh, on the icg you have pachy vessel hypermobility and plaques on the icg phase the oct of course is quite typical it shows increased choroidal thickness which will focal or diffuse pachy vessels and a heterogeneously hyperreflective material the double layer sign the OCTA now shows the tangled network of uh, flow signal, which is very well differentiated in a lot of patients with the RP and the book I mean, overlying the focal area of the thickening so Interestingly, our Italian group has kind of shown the difference of what are the kind of scoring parameters between the two. So they have given a, 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 a plus points for age, sex, choroidal thickness, more than 300 early pachy vessels. Uh, MNV on OCTA is rather three points and negative marking for type 2 and type 3 uh, PNV. Uh, sorry, uh, MNV presence of intraretinal fluid at 0 0.5. So they found uh, they found that a high score of 11.5 is possible, and at any value over 6.5 would kind of tell, turn more towards pachycoroid neovascularity. So pachycoroid neovascularity actually has a variety of presentation. It can be silent, simmering, or searing. So if interesting, a patient you know followed up from 2019 to 2021. You see that the vision, the structural OCT, and the network are absolutely stable in the. In don't need to actually worry about them. You don't. The patient uh, who is a 50 year old, you like a CSR patient, uh, the, the angiography, the OCT, typical. But once it's 50 years, make sure that you scroll the area well, see the double layer sign in one of the areas. And then when you do the OCT, you see the network very much there. Simmering is what we kind of, man, I mean, see most often at these 
the vasculopathies have a very good response to anti-VEGF, but some activity just keeps recurring. So they do well on treat and extend. So this is the patient uh, who is a 55-year-old male who was 10 years back, he had been treated by us for CSR, came back 10 years later, and we diagnosed pachycoroid neovasculopathy. And interestingly, the follow-up from May 2018, uh, March 2019, he Wired six injections of Eflibacep did very well. He had a dry macula. Then after that, we kept following him up. Interestingly, a year, year and a half down the line, the macula is dry, but the network has increased in size gradually. And then when you come on to the Jan 2021, the patient is now symptomatic. You've restarted treatment. He, at this time, he's not as responding as well. Controlled on treat and extend very good visual acuity but it does not go away. So it just keeps simmering there. And maybe by the end, are we looking into a polyp or aneurysmal area developing at the edge? So this is a 65-year-old lady who was doing very well on bevacizumab. So this is a typical, uh, you know, you see this uh, hyperreflective uh, uh, under the bee, pachy un with the pachyvis. This is the magnified image, and this is the network that you see. So it, from August 2017 to March 2019, on bevacizumab, doing pretty well, st quite stable, the lesion size is the same, but then suddenly there's a jump, and now after that the intraretinal fluid increases, and the patient has now started becoming relatively non-respondive. We are wondering whether it's a polyp that is developing. We advise ICG. Unfortunately, she was lost to COVID times. But interestingly, if you see the choroidal thickness actually has decreased from uh, uh, 286 to 276, so this is actually well summarized in the paper that is the vanishing pachycoroid, and that's why they've questioned the definition of pachycoroid neovascular. Uh, no, we all know that it's part of the spectrum. So this was a 48-year-old eight, eight lady who had chronic CSC, and presented in July 2017. One-eyed lady had a scarred macula. The PED there, you see uh, on the ICG, there's no, uh, uh, it's, there's no plaque in the, uh, at this present moment. So she was put on um, eflinuron, whether we like it or not. Uh, she was stable for four years. She dried up very well and then was stable for four years and then came back in May 2020 when you see a neovascularization. The pachycoroid neovascularity is developing quite well. So this is the comparative uh, autofluorescence ICG. I'm just right. And that is there. So this, of course, so this is the continuum going on to the, from the pachycoroid neovascularity. We go on to the PC. So in, uh, just as a nutshell, the so management, the difference is you get a longer treatment-free interval, the treatment then works well. Probably a flibacet works better due to better action on vascular hyperpermeability. Few instances of atrophy, maybe a role of combination therapy, but tends to recur. So in summary, I would say we should have a high suspicion than type 1 CNVM in younger age. The CSR-like presentation in the older age group. OCT is very helpful in these patients to diagnose and follow up. Intravital flibacet seems more effective has various progression patterns, so you have to be monitor them quite well and maybe monitor for polypoidal leaks on the fall. Big thank you to my optometrist team. Dr. Chan, for that excellent talk. Like, I would like to request Dr. Josh to explain, like, uh, will you, uh, like you are, whether your first line changes, if your diagnosis is acicular neovasculopathy versus a neovascular AMD? First, before that, as uh, has very important role in diagnosis. Subtle new vessel can very easily miss in the in the in the uh, setting of the C because the the fluorescent ICG guy just that area. You just without this subtle small neovascularization phone that is the best investigation because you might miss out on this small neovascularization. Because another thing is when you have a setting of chronic CSC or patient had episode of CSC and patient presents to you the subtle new vessels which is on octa, whether it's a secondary CNVM or is it a pachy neovasculopathy is the you know that secondary CNVM type 1 can happen in CSC. Currently there is a dry, I mean there is, there is a gray area between uh, the secondary CNVMs in the uh, pachychoroid with earlier CSC and presence of a first presentation of a fluid pachyneovasculopathy that is still undefined properly coming to the treatment per se uh, i do not i mean uh, it's shown by the japanese group that aflibercept has better efficacy it not only regresses the subtle new vessels but it even reduces the choroidal thickness for one year on treatment for pachyneovasculopathy aflibercept we know uh, compared to the uh, the regular anti 
may be more potent and penetrates better. So uh, that would be my first choice is the patient is affordable. It's all purely an affor affordability, uh, you know, choice. Otherwise, I would go for regular antibiotics. Right point that TOCK has helped us in identifying this. But at the same time, are we over diagnosing? There's one thing like which come across a case, they see clinical and clinical examination, they showed a new vessel, but uh, within a few days, it on itself, two weeks' time. Your opinion over diagnosing, are we treating the crescent CNVC? For us, we have become. All these are patients. Whatever it is, I wouldn't sit on it, say, don't know. So I would treat, then say, non response. Even if you are in doubt and you think it's quiescent and non leaking and very early and you don't want to do, at least you know something is happening and you can discuss with the patient to come back to you at the earliest onset of metamorphopsia. That is, in case you don't want to inject right away. Thank you. That over. How long was the months? First, first six months, and then was four years. Back with the bounce back. That's so the patient actually, yeah, she was on epinephrine. Uh, six months after that was on regular follow up, so like a year, but we then came back with a lot. From this, what doing? But uh, actually, we had the plex from 2017. Very lucky, I think that's why we have a. So what I mean to have uh, some of long term as clinic, not no as clinic. I personally feel that any patient at the age of 50 comes to this part of the examination about vascular and also about that patients as said with careful follow up and said that point of view I think that Dr. Jaj to take the stage. I would request the AV team to please play the slides. To summarize, like uh, pachycoroid neovasculopathy, we are diagnosing more well due to the availability of uh, OCT angiography. And uh, OCT angiography should be considered in all the patients of uh, presenting with subretinal fluid for the, in an elderly age group, in an age group more than 50. The aflibercept would be a Better choice in such cases due to their see on the choroidal vessels. Over to you, Dr. George. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. So, let us look at TV day versus switch versus combination treatment. We have seen through the Everest study and Everest 2 study that the combination with and of and ranibizumab is much better than ranibizumab monotherapy as far as the complete polyprogression and the visual acuity gains in the patients. So, and moreover, half the number of injections uh, in the PDT combination arm. Then came aflibercept monotherapy with planet study. 80% of the patients who without rescue PDT achieved 10 letter gain and 80% of them achieved polyp inactivation. So this polyp inactivation is not polyp complete polyp regression. It is still 40% of 
almost similar to ranibizumab with uh, aflibercept monotherapy. More importantly, they reduce the number of injections in the second year with treat and extend regime, maintaining the 10 letter gain and uh, with half the number of injections, four injections in the second year with treat and extend uh, compared to the first year with bi-monthly injection. So let us look at some of the case examples. The first patient is a 50 year old lady who has sudden loss of vision, large submacular hemorrhage. You can see the hemorrhagic peaks at the macula and uh, six vision. Because of the hemorrhage, extensive hemorrhage, the ICGA was not done at this time. Patient was started on aflibercept monotherapy injection. And uh, uh, as you can see here, after the third injection, the submacular blood has gone in this hemorrhagic um, PCV. And uh, the OCT also has returned to a normal foveal contour here. Uh, and of the inferior hemorrhagic PDs are persisting with subtle fluid also. At this time, ICG was done to see is there any active polyp in this patient after the initial three loading doses. No polyps. Polyps have regressed with aflibercept monotherapy except for a small BVN leakage that you can see in the late phase uh, of ICG angiography. So this is the first visit, hemorrhagic PCV, and after three injections, a uh, good foveal contour. So this patient stays. No switching stays on the uh, anti of monotherapy on a treat and extend regime. So the second patient is a doctor, defective vision in the right eye, the typical notched irregular PED under the macula with a large serous PED which you can see, but there is a polyp in the early, mid and late phase of the ICG angiography and three, uh, four monthly injections of ranibizumab is unhappy and uh, now we decided to switch, switch actually. So before and after the switch, first injection, second injection and third injection, only double layer sign is persisting. You can see that at that time, uh, ICG shows the polyps have gone, only the PED is remaining, a small PN leakage is there in the late phase. So patient is put on a treat and extend regime and uh, this is after the switching and this is after one year, six injections and uh, this is what the switching does to uh, uh, in uh, to uh, uh, resistant to the regular anti of therapy. The third patient is a combination patient because one night patient, 60 year old patient, uh, other eye lost to breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage, typical thumb like PED and notched PED is fluid, the ICG shows polypoidal lesions at the macula and initially before COVID we had done a low fluence PDT and ranibizumab and uh, fluid is there persisting after three months of uh, low fluence PDT. So this, th at this time uh, we continued three more injections but fluid is persisting, the PED is resistant here. So switch to aflibercept and there is macular drying but the PED is not flattening here. The patient, the first patient we saw complete flattening of the PED and at that time, repeated the ICG, the polyps have not gone, it's still persistent there. So this is an indication for combination treatment. Despite switching, uh, uh, the patient uh, PED is not going, polyps are not going away. Standard fluence PD with aflibercept, there's a uh, next remission for the next one year. So this is switching and despite fluid is persisting. So many clinics, as we know, lack the facility of PDT and ICG currently. The so planet study results can be extrapolated to the clinical practice with a non-invasive OCT octa diagnosis and monthly injections of aflibercept. And if the after the initial loading doses, like how I showed in the patients, the patients are stable, continue either on two monthly injections or treat and extend, which I prefer. And or if the persistent fluid and polyp on ICG, uh, consider PDT, though uh, the, it's a limited availability currently in India. So uh, a recent randomized control trial, which has just come out in 2022, to replace the PDT, they have shown that uh, a novel treat and extend regime, if after the initial three loading doses, if the polyps are persisting, continue with another three monthly doses and, they have, and then shift to treat and extend. So this regime has been shown to be as effective with polyp regression over the uh, one year uh, and this is a, actually an alternative approach to PDT with prolonged induction phase followed by treat and extend regime. They have compared in one arm uh, the regular planet recommendation once in two months injection but this regime had particularly higher regression of polyps. So I am winding up uh, the PDT is because reactivation of this uh, polyp inactivation in the second year of therapy 
could uh, result in sudden submacular, submacular hemorrhage. So, uh, this has to be polyp regression is an important endpoint. So, consider this um, uh, treatment because uh, the antivage of monotherapy has currently become the first line. Uh, we have better molecules like aflibercept and brolicizumab and switching is an alternative to PDT with extended loading dose and treat and extend regime following high, higher polyp regression. The PDT combination is reserved currently for uh, persistent polypoid lesion despite intense antivage of therapy. Thank you for your kind. Thank you Dr. Jart for that wonderful talk. Like I would request Dr. Giridhar to opine like, uh, uh, like would you really look for a polyp regression? Would you consider repeat ICG how often during the follow up of case? Polyp regression definitely is important. Reached an endpoint as far as the, probably the chance of recurrence is delayed. Come back, then once you have not achieved polyp regression, then obviously you have to go either into a TNE or on a persistent. From that point of view, I repeat ICGA when I don't get proper response. Like what he should. When we don't get a proper response, I repeat. Say the out of uh, in, there is enough uh, what you call biomarkers and FY. So the take home message, as far as uh, again, a very nice talk. George is giving wonderful talks. DRF also he spoke extremely well. So I think the take home message is aflibercept is probably the drug of choice as far as antivage is concerned. Ranibizumab, I think, has got very limited role in polypoidal disease. In the way patients are willing, I think, we aflibercept. And the most important point is aflibercept also gives you progression of PED, not just polycystumab. Aflibercept also, there is decrease in the size of the polypoidal PED. I mean, that's what you need to look at. Particularly when you are following up patients with polypoidal disease, look at the polypoidal PED because the other PEDs may be hemorrhagic, it may be serious, but we want regression of the polypoidal PED and we are achieving that with a sizable number of patients on aflibercept monotherapy. And probably with the scheme, I mean, and moreover, you need to educate the patients that you need at least two, three injections initially itself. To clarify things, like uh, you consider an ICG even if it's doing well, doing well, you would stop the treatment and not consider it to an extent. That's what you mean, or you would consider I not respond. If so, I don't do ICG now as a follow up of patients. Earlier, when we were doing the combination therapy, we used to do the ICG yeah, three months after the combination therapy. But now, with the monotherapy, at least in my practice, ICG is not the scheme of routinely as a follow up. Let me talking about ICG. The thing is that take first now, the instructions are defined for people. Everybody doesn't have biomarker. That's a very reality. Is that uh, when you talked about applicable long look, what is a con? And uh, Ruby. Because we, I already mentioned that a, a combination of OC and doctor, all of us know that gives around 80-90% diagnosis. We don't need it now. So uh, previously we just, we all uh, on ICG. So diagnosis and starting the treatment, you don't need it. So, but once you give the loading doses, uh, there is an indefiniteness about polyp inactivation. After the, this doesn't happen in the first year. Second year or third year, patient might uh, come with a sudden uh, hemorrhage and they might be 6 6 vision like the second patient I showed, and you relax because it's a polyp inactivation. That is where the role of ICG comes in. You can, as I showed, the initial polyp has regressed. So now the beautiful two papers have beautiful papers have come out showing that 50% of the patients have actual polyp regression with aflibercept in the six months of monotherapy. Now we have moved to monotherapy as a first line, antivage of monotherapy. So now we need to know, to talk to the patient that you are safe, you can put on once in three months follow up. We want to do treat, extend and stop. Not lifelong treat and extend injection. We want to stop. 
So how do you decide that this patient won't develop a submacular hemorrhage the second year of my therapy? I'm talking about patients who are on two to three years of therapy. So at that some time point, uh, if the patient, the smoldering case, the third case which I showed, I wasn't happy at all, neither he, because one night patient. So we, at that point, we need to see whether it's a polyp that is persistent or not. So with her question, that first three months, we lo loading dose, the new randomized trial, which looked at once in two months injection versus treat and extend showed that uh, after the first three injections, if you feel the polyps have not regressed, continue with an extended loading dose, which will bring in at least 60% polyp regression. Then you extend and probably second year, you can stop the treatment and follow up the patient once in three months. This is what I, I prefer to do. The other panelist, when, when would you stop treatment? Like you are part of the regime, but when would you think of stopping the treatment? I think what George said on it elaborately, uh, if the regimen, you give the first loading or the extending loading, you see the response. And you can see the response very well on OC and Octa. And with Jamie, like we have described all those signs which are biomarkers well established. Now coming to when would you stop it? If the patient is behaving well and everything is fine and you want to stop after one year, two years, I would do ICGA at that point of time. I agree with you. It's not only for PCV because we do that for uveitis as well. You want to pick out any subclinical disease. Because for OCT and OCTA, you focus what you see clinically and you are scanning that area. But on ICGA disease, which is not clinically obvious, and you know there is a polyp, then you can uh, make your decision based on that and the patient's requirement. I'm not saying you see and you just start injecting. But you can customize and personalize your therapy because you know it is. Last question, like uh, would anyone consider a combination of steroid along with anti-VEGF in consistent piece? Oh, because there is a congested choroid at the back and we have venous overload. Don't know whether it is polyp, where it is coming from. There are pecky vessels. So you would not want to congest the steroid further by injecting more steroids. Yeah, I, I would agree with uh, Vaishali, Madam, on uh, so, uh, Excellent talk. So just one more comment I had to make. We are looking for an extended therapy. Uh, do consider doing a video ICG for all your patients. Because uh, looking for those pulsatile polyps would be at a greater risk for developing submacular hemorrhage as I've seen in one of the cases. So consider, would that alter your treatment maybe after one year, two years from the basic? Going, going for a video ICG and yeah. looking for those pulses. Yeah, How I, would that alter your line of anti vogf mode? Yeah, it has been shown that these pulsatile polyps have higher chances of submacular heme. Uh, uh, and that is picked up mainly on the first one minute of video. I agree with you, but in, in regular practice, uh, I do not do that. I mean, honestly, uh, because uh, you need to be there while the procedure is. But ideally, if you have a resistant case, Definitely, it's worth doing. Last quick comment by Dr. Raj Narayan. Question. Contra points. Available free. But you can. Value of that. Not like we are going to do. Like. Needed. Really makes a difference. It is one pachycoroid disease of any variety. Even sometimes we have a confusion about whether it's or not. Choroidal, vascular, permeable. The ICG can give even your OC hands depth cannot tell whether the capillary. That's one thing. The other thing is um, choroid along with anti we have published. In resistant cases, uh, we have one and wonderful results where anti vegf is not working at all. CT really flattens immediately when you give it. May be because the anti vegf or resistance for some reason right, potentiates the overall. I would say that uh, both can be considered. Thank you, sir.
I'd like to request Dr. Ramesh Wing for the right speech. I would request the AV team to play the slides. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we know that uh, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy is an aneurysmal lesion of the choroidal vasculature and presents with extensive sub-RP, hemorrhagic PEDs or even extensive intraretinal or subretinal exudation. And what you find on the ICG is the characteristic polyplic lesions with or without an abnormal vascular uh, network. So the, based on the location of the polyp lesion, where the polyps are located, you are basically going to classify them into two groups, whether it's a macular PCV or whether you have a peripheral PCV or a PHCR group of diseases, where the location of the disease is anterior to the equator in PHCR and uh, posterior to the equator in macular diseases. But you have certain areas where the disease may fall somewhere in between, uh, exactly at the, at the equatorial region. And in this case, you can see that this is just above the superior arcade, not anterior to the uh, equator. And you can see these polyp-like lesions which are present and confirmed on the ICG as well. Now, it's very important to understand how does the peripheral choroid and the macular choroid behave. And this is a very important paper which uh, Dr. Darius and his team uh, had reported in Retina Journal, where they spoke about the classical club-shaped choroid which you have in the peripheral uh, <laughs> PHCR cases where the choroid is more thicker in the peripheral, uh, peripheral retina and uh, in the peripheral areas and compared to the normal controls where you have a more bowel shaped choroid where the macular choroid is more thicker in these cases. So the basic crux of this presentation is going to be based on the paper which we published uh, recently comparing the peripheral and the macular PCV cases uh, in, in the European Journal of Ophthalmology. So we had a group of cases where we retrospectively compared the PHCR or the P peripheral PCV cases and the macular PCV cases and there are some important results which we got. So what we found is that patients with peripheral PCVs or were much older in age compared to the macular PCV uh, group. Also, when you look at the subretinal hemorrhage, the subretinal hemorrhage was more extensive in the peripheral PCV group compared to the mac macular PCV group. The hard exudation was more with the macular PCV group. The number of polyps which you could identify in the peripheral PCVs were much larger. And the abnormal vascular network or the branching vascular network which you tend to identify in the peripheral, in the macular PCV group is less frequently seen with the peripheral PCV group. Also, a very interesting point which we found was the choroidal thickness in these cases. When, when you looked at the macular choroid in patients with peripheral PCV versus the macular PCV, you can find that the macular PCV had a much thicker choroid compared to the peripheral choroid. So basically, these peripheral PHCR cases or the peripheral PCVs, they were more common in the temporal periphery with larger number of polyps, with more hemorrhagic complications, lesser exudation, and less frequently seen branching vascular network and a thinner rock choroid at the, at the macula. The question we tend to ask is why the temporal periphery is more, <laughs> more, more commonly involved. And the reason probably for this is the temporal vortex vein. They, lay, they drain a larger area of the choroid compared to the nasal side. And this causes the choroidal venous overload and the vortex vein engorgement on the temporal side. And this also probably explains why you have a larger number of polyps and the increased hemorrhagic complications in the PHCR cases. Now, why hemorrhagic complications? Like what I said, it's the choroidal venous overload which happens, the thinner choroid in the periphery and also you have a lesser choroidal vessel caliber which causes increased vessel resistance and therefore increased transluminal pressure and increased hemorrhagic complications. So, this is based on the Poisley's law which you use for any vascular uh, vessel. When we look at the treatment options which you are providing for the peripheral PCV groups, you tend to treat them more with, uh, with the tr trans cryo with transcleral cryo or with focal laser, whereas the macular PCV groups, you tend to treat them with more with anti-VGF monotherapy and PDT if it is available in your center. So, uh, so this is a case which I just wanted to show, 80-year-old male who complained of decrease of vision in the one, one month, right eye, having a visual acuity of hand movements, presenting with an extensive breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage, and the patient underwent vitrectomy with injection ilia, and this is what you see on day one post uh, vitrectomy, where you have these massive hemorrhages, subretinal hemorrhages, which are present in the periphery, and then you do the ICG to identify those polyps which are sitting in the periphery, treat them further with transcleral cryo and focal laser, and this is what you achieve at the end of one year post treatment, a totally resolved kind of a disease. 
Now, this is the other eye of the same patient where you had these peripheral drusen-like lesions which were present and one year later, you can see that there is a fresh bleed which has happened in the nasal, supranasal periphery in this patient and the ICG shows you probably that there are polyps and even the choroidal vessels. You can see the vortex veins which are congested in these cases. The other treatment options which you have is the uh, external drainage which you can consider in some situations. So what I want to just summarize is that peripheral PCVs and macular PCVs are totally two different entities and the choroid is much thinner the, at the fovea in, in the peripheral PCV group than in the macular PCV group. This is, uh, I just want to acknowledge my team and thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Ramesh for the wonderful cases. Like uh, I would like to request Dr. Uh, Shobha Shobha to opine like uh, uh, like at what point would you consider a white field angiography like uh, like would you start treatment initially with the anti vegf or you first consider at the first visit itself or you wait for the blood to come down and then consider white field angiography cases like that where there is so much of hemorrhage there is no point doing that point start them on aflibercept wait till the hemorrhage resolves and we want to confirm our diagnosis That there is a difference between the two. I always thought there were one disease on one side. That's a good finding. How about like uh, loading dose? Like, could you consider loading dose even with uh, the P for the PHCR cases? Or exactly, well, like what George said, continue injecting as much as every month. Stability. In this case, the hemorrhage solved to such an extent that we can do an ICG. Don't go beyond anti vegf for to come in one difference is here you have predictable lesions in the periphery unlike the macular pcv so uh, unless it's a breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage which you need to clear with surgery even after surgery as uh, venkatesh has shown icg is important here why because you cannot keep injecting in a vitrectomized eye one thing even in a non vitrectomized eye these are easily treatable with laser or TTT or cryo. These small polypoidal lesions in the periphery, we can ablate it actually. You don't need to go on injecting uh, forever. So, um, as Dr. Uh, Shoba has said, initially, but for the blood to disappear, you can give uh, injections. To a, uh, that is where your question is when will you do an ICG? Yes, I would do an ICG at least with the Heidelberg kind of view, not optos pick up these vessels, ablate it laser, you're done. For the time you're done and then follow up the patient. Patients can have new polyps after a year or so that we need to keep a follow up and uh, pick it up. All the panelists, like, could you, any of you consider cryo, like, or is it the laser or any of you consider cryotherapy if you're not very sure about the lesion? Laser. Laser. You know, only for cases where uh, you know you cannot do even with a LIO and uh, depression and the blood is, uh, but you will wait for the blood with anti of therapy to go I mean one of the I mean uh, one of the features of a PP it is peripheral native hemorrhagic uh, is uh, get the hemorrhage and once the, the scar then the spontaneous regression of the also full network itself becomes scar very important to repeat the ICG once there is a partial resolution. After we, after your vitrectomy, sometimes when you do the ICG, you may not see anything at all because it's all scarred. So uh, therefore, that that the bleeding itself acts as an endpoint the disease. That's a very interesting observation as far as this concerned. And if the macula is spared, patients end up with reasonably visual acuity. The cryo only indication probably reference. I know if you have a not. Like while we discussed laser, like what would be the end point of laser? Like how would we decide that, okay, like the laser I have done is probably sufficient. Uh, During the treatment, sir, like as such, when you treat at that time. Grade three, grade four burns. Uh, I mean, the, the parameters are something like what we used to use earlier for uh, the uh, wet AMD patients. That, I mean, extra foveal, just uh, wet AMD patients using the thermal laser. So you need to have more penetration. You need to have a 200 millisecond in, uh, interval so that it penetrates more. The longer duration burns and the heavy burns, confluent burns. 
and probably you can even since it's periphery you're not doing any harm so you can give little uh, the, the treatment can extend little beyond what you're seeing because sometimes the network you may not see very well in your icga it's only the polyps so you can just treat it a little more than what we normally see there that you get a very i mean the treatment is reasonably adequate another thing since it's in the periphery there is no need to panic and do everything at a time, it has to be done in a very staged manner. Like you do injection, see for this, do imaging. You don't shoot all the guns at the time because you don't, you want to avoid traction and complications related to treatment. So I guess it can be planned very nicely. And so, peripheral and macular, wanted to know what your probably was. What you showed in periphery was extreme periphery, arterial and beyond. But there are many cases near the arcades also you have polyps, don't have the branching near vascular. They have like what you have shown in the little one. Those are ones where they also can bleed. They are just macular near the arcade, just within the arcade also. There you just have to laser them. I mean, you don't have the option of the important point which you have Told is polyps are not associated with the end, just isolated for the disease, not aneurysmal uh, type 1 PC or there are different terminology we need present it. There's definitely an overlap of the signs and the symptoms which you get with the macular and the peripheral, but the important thing is the absence of the vascular network, the abnormal vascular network which you get in these cases. And therefore, just treating those aneurysms directly with laser probably gives you the best uh, result. Regarding the definition which we used in the study was the location of the lesions relationship to the equator, whether those lesions were anterior to the equator or posterior to the equator. So you can have a lesion which is just outside the arcade, but then we still consider them to be a macular lesion. So even, even the macular uh, arcade kind of PC, they just have isolated points. I understand that, yeah. Thank you all for the wonderful comments. I would request Dr. Niroj to. Can I have this like? First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the fantastic hospitality. So I'll be presenting something about uh, the evolution of uh, retinal pigment epithelium abnormalities in CACR. So this is a 10 year uh, analysis and some of the sli uh, images that will be showing will be slightly older and the quality will be slightly less because of the 10 years uh, image. Uh, we all know uh, CACR to be a very benign, self-resolving, having good visual prognosis. And there are several uh, articles on uh, how the RP abnormalities evolve or change over time. But uh, they all fail to and, uh, make us understand how something like this could end up like uh, this, with extensive RP alteration. So we did a 10-year uh, uh, analysis of uh, a simple and complex CACR. We classified them into simple and complex according to the new classification and evaluated, evaluated the longitudinal changes in the RP alterations over time. So the retrospective multicentric uh, study uh, of uh, all CACR patients with 10-year follow-up and the data included uh, the demographics, visual equity and uh, uh, these eyes were divided into either simple or complex based on the newer multimodal image based classification. So according to this, uh, complex included all eyes with more than two disc areas of RP alteration and they have to be multifocal. Uh, we uh, analyzed the RP characteristics of these uh, patients uh, and uh, divided them into again two types. Uh, one was uh, uh, multiple islands of uh, RP, focal RP alterations. These were uh, window defects uh, seen on FFA or uh, hyperfluorescent spots on AF, uh, autofluorescence. And the, we also divided them, uh, classified another group uh, with uh, due to the SRF, they were either stippled or uh, uh, diffuse hyperfluorescent due to the SRF. Uh, now in terms of RP characteristics, all these, these two uh, types of RP alterations were analyzed over time and how these uh, evolved uh, over 10 years. We also analyzed the recurrence rates of these two uh, simple and complex CACR diseases. Now coming to the results, uh, uh, we analyzed 67 eyes of 39 patients. The sample size was less because of the, the strict follow-up criteria. Uh, the age was uh, around 51 and uh, it included 12 uh, simple and 55 complex eyes. 
In terms of uh, duration of symptoms, uh, overall around uh, three months, uh, it was for the overall cohort. But if you see the simple CACR uh, cases, they were less than three months and the complex were around 30 months. Comparing the uh, baseline and final BCVA, both uh, uh, in all the cases, uh, the final BCVA and the baseline BCVA was better in uh, simple CSA cases. In terms of ICE requiring treatment and recurrences, again, simple CSA were much uh, lower than complex CSA cases. Uh, 23 eyes had same site leakage, four had uh, 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 different site leak, and four, seven had same plus different site leak in uh, uh, cases which had a documented angiogram. Again, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of how often the recurrence happened, uh, we did a survival graph. You can see uh, see how different the patterns are. Simple CSA cases had a significantly lower uh, rate of recurrence, and uh, the mean uh, uh, the ten year recurrence probability was also uh, significantly lower in simple CSR cases. Cordial neovasculation in uh, no eyes in simple CSR group. They did not have any uh, CNVM, while five eyes in the chronic CSR group, uh, co complex CSR group had uh, uh, CNVM. In terms of RP characteristics, uh, if you look at uh, uh, simple CSR eyes, uh, only two eyes had complex features at the end of uh, 10 years, while in complex CSR eyes, you can see the multifocality increased from a uh, mean of uh, 2.9 to around 3.8 over 10 years period. Now, uh, we did also did an ICG for around 37 patients, uh, and uh, we could see uh, MPHP in all uh, those areas where they had RP alterations. And these MPHPs are uh, hyperfluorescence uh, seen on ICG at around, uh, which increase in intensity of around uh, 7 to 10 minutes. Uh, this uh, MPHP is also uh, uh, corresponding to the areas of leakage. Uh, as you can see here, at baseline, there was uh, uh, no leakage uh, in this area, but uh, there was an MPHP which further uh, went on to have a leakage over time. Again, another point regarding MPHP was that in eyes that did not have recurrence, did not show MPHP during follow-up also. As you can see in this case, this patient did not have recurrence for 10 years, and on ICG you can see here there is no MPHP. Uh, this uh, image shows how, if you can uh, look at this small focal area, there is a MPHP and there is no RP alteration at baseline. If you follow up this case over time, there is the MPHP is slightly disappearing and the RP alterations are uh, starting to come up and uh, then a PED uh, appears uh, and the MPHP is uh, almost gone here. So these MPHP have uh, uh, yeah. implication in these cases. So I'd like to summarize that uh, classifying CSR at baseline could help predict uh, recurrences and progression of MPHP to RP alteration and leakage. It also give us clue regarding treatment uh, management and uh, uh, guiding us to prevent recurrence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Niroj, for your work. I would request uh, Dr. Vaishalvi to just highlight like uh, how it would be really uh, clinically reliable, like, like clinically how it would be useful for us managing. I don't know. Honestly, it's always good. This is the best way to see 10 year follow up and how to go about the progression. I think what you need to do is probably go to the imaging biomarkers and see the health of the photoreceptors and what were the biomarkers in the beginning that resulted in the poorer outcome over a period of time uh, rather than just the RP abnormalities I understand on autofluorescence. And the second is you would have treated them differently uh, because you have 10 years, so you would have a different kind of the treatment available. So what was the caring of those treatment in developing the long-term bad prognosis? That is the kind of the analysis I think the answer can come from. You know, because these studies have those kind of... Uh, in fact, if you have the serial good quality, Jason. Being a retrospective uh, cohort, at the beginning you have told simple and chronic. At that complex. time, you're complex. Actually, this simple, this basically uh, imaging terminology, simple and complex, the beginning. That patient would have had chronic CSR in the beginning, produce those complex uh, CSR findings. Amazing finding is what you're calling as complex. 
and you are saying that at the simple CSR, very few progress to chronic CSR, isn't it? Recurrences and so at the baseline itself, you had two groups. I would call as acute and chronic, and you say you are saying in another words as that the chronic or complex CSR went on to develop progress, isn't it? Isn't there a uh, you know, um, confusion or contradiction in that actually you have at the baseline itself you had patients with chronic CSR showing complex finding and the same group you have shown that after 10 years had more recurrences. This is what we already know about actually. Agreed. So, uh, if you just uh, classify them as chronic, you can see the duration of symptoms in some of the complex cases also. So, if you classify complex CSR as acute CSR in those. No, no, but we could have treated them, the chronic ones, VTs, DT, something. So yeah. that might, a subset analysis might. Yeah, that has not been looked into this actually. Okay. So they have not looked into that. But uh, being, as you mentioned, uh, being a retrospective study, uh, the point of classifying into simple and co um, complex is purely based on an imaging. But these are the patients who have acute and chronic based on their longevity of symptoms and uh, signs actually. So you should uh, in some way when you are looking at over a 10 year period, there should be you know uh, more uh, description of rather than simple and complex on I think. Then only we will get important biomarkers from this study. There is a lot of potential work on it without more data. Yeah, I think the important message. I have also, my colleague, importance of autofluorescence. Whenever we see a patient with CSCR, we need to do an OCT and an autofluorescence. Because autofluorescence tells us whether it is long standing. I mean, this phenology acute, simple complex, there are a lot of, there is a lot of complexity in the classification of simple and complex. I have already spoken to Jai on that. Because when you have patches of uh, decreased autofluorescence, now how do you say? He says two disc diameters. But then when you have two, three patches of, uh, uh, decrease autofluorescence. Now, how do you measure? So the the definition of simple complex is very complex. So let us not use that now. It still needs uh, defi redefining and uh, this thing. But autofluorescence definitely is a very useful imaging modality in patients with. Yeah, thank you for the yeah. wonderful okay. discussion and uh, points. I would request Dr. Deepak to deliver his talk. Request the AV team. Slides, please. I'd like to discuss on our study web source OCT angiography characteristics of activity in myopic choroidal neovascularization. So, as we all know, myopic CNV is one of the most common cause of vision loss in pathological myopes. Classic leak on FFA is considered to be the gold standard in the diagnosis. Aimed at finding out certain characteristics on OCT that will be helpful in detecting whether the myopic CNVM is active or not. That was our primary objective. The secondary objective was to assess the follow-up images of active myopic CNV and also to quantify the vascular density of the myopic CNV. This was a retrospective observational study. All treatment name myopic CNV were included in our study. Imaging records with significant artifacts and poor signal strength were excluded from the study. So, overall 35 eyes were studied and 19 eyes were considered to be eligible for the study. They were categorized into two groups, active and fibrotic. Active groups showed classic leak on FFA. Fibrotics group showed a fibrous scar with whitish appearance on fundus examination with staining on FFA. So the follow-up records of group A were also examined. MCNV eyes which had gone into remission, that is when they showed six months of inactivity post anti of treatment, they were classified as group R or remission group. So the images were clear designed and they were uh, collected and they were examined by two senior retina specialists who were blinded from each other. The qualitative parameters studied included pattern, presence or absence of outer halo, margin definition as well as the flow on the B-scan OCTA. Four patterns were described based on previous studies and our observations. One is interlacing, medusa head, tetri pattern and when the pattern was not very well defined, it was called as poorly defined pattern. Quantitative characteristics were studied with the help of image J. And uh, it was manually designed, I mean, detected the greatest linear dimension and area was uh, measured. The infast vascular density was uh, uh, detected with the help of Huang's algorithm. The images were taken up and cropped and binarized with the help of Huang's algorithm into two white pixels and dark pixels. 
white pixels indicated areas of flow dark pixels indicated areas of no flow the ratio helped in giving up the giving us the vascular density so showing up a few sample images this was a case of active cnv which showed filamentous branching vessels pulling a medusa head it was termed as medusa head the b scan showed incomplete flow it was another case of active cnv which showed classic leak on ffa a magnified view helped in understanding that this image had a net like pattern which was interlacing and hence it was termed as interlacing variant post treatment and post four injections of anti vegf it went into remission pattern became more poorly defined and the area on gld also enlarged this was classified as poorly defined pattern and fell under the remission group or group r these are two examples of fibrotic cnv which are large which showed large mature vessels with less amount of branching with spaces in between this was termed as detri pattern coming back, coming to the main results qualitative parameters included i mean they were compared between the two groups active and the fibrotic the interlacing variant was more commonly seen in the active group whereas the fibrotic variant was more commonly seen in the det i mean uh, i mean the detri pattern was more commonly seen in the fibrotic group margins became more poorly defined the fibrotic group the b scan showed more of an incomplete flow halo was visible only in two cases in the active group the greatest linear dimension in the area was significantly larger in the fibrotic group vascular density calculated with the image j was significantly lower in the fibrotic group similarly when comparing the active and the remission groups remission group showed more of a poorly defined pattern margins became more ill defined the b scan flow again became more incomplete the halo was not visible in any of the cases GLD and area were also significantly higher in the remission group the vascular density was also significantly lower so coming to the discussion point the interlacing variant which was more commonly seen in the active group uh, had tiny loops and net like pattern finding out an interlacing pattern in OCTA highly uh, was suggestive of neovascular activity it was also supported by previous studies uh, the tree pattern showed more of mature vessels and it indicated that the variant is more of a fibrotic and scar type uh, cnv the other qualitative parameters had high inter observer variability and they were not reliable though it, were, it was very much useful in finding out the diagnosis similarly the mcnv had a higher area and gld in the fibrotic and the remission uh, variants what we presume is that the mcv mc that is myopic cnv tends to enlarge in the transverse plane respective of the treatment the vascular density again was higher in the active group when compared to the other two groups what we recommend is that more quantitative parameters can be instilled in the software so that it not only useful in diagnosis of mcnv but also it can be useful in the follow up the limitation is that of a poor sample size and the lesser sensitivity of octa so ffa is still considered to be the gold standard octa is a very handy tool the only disadvantage is that it is uh, it has a very poor sensitivity rate thank you dr deepak good request the most important uh, issue that we face with uh, imaging uh, myopic scan we talked uh, is like the segmentation artifact due to the presence of the epithelioma so considering the artifacts in this like how can we like make sure that we are not dealing with an artifact that it's mainly a, that we are seeing so one of the few images like not very sure like uh, could you define when what was mentioned like not very sure when uh, so myopic okay, i mean i know we have to do multimodal imaging and you said fluorescent angiography is the gold standard we often find it very tricky to do uh, to find is active or not thing just fluorescent angiography uh, we always tend to look at the oct because the oct is to give away a sign the sherm is there or sometimes there will be whatever it is If I didn't do this OCT study today, if I look at the OCT, I can tell you what sort of OCT. OCT does not give us any additional information about a myopic CNV. You can confirm a CNV, but I think for activity, I will always only depend on on OC rather than I find angiogram difficult. Particular myopic CNV, the OCT sometimes it also very difficult to in. SRF is not obviously seen. Yeah, so sherm, sherm is the giveaway sign. So is it sherm or is it fibrotic CNV? That is what you want to differ. Because sherm is invariably present in an active. You look at the fluffiness and go by that. 
when you are seeing Sherm, look at the pitchfork sign. So if you have the pitchfork sign like fuzziness and coming into the outer layer, that is a very important indicator that there is new vascularity. And secondly, look at the flow signals. If you see more than 40% of this uh, Sherm has a vascularity, it's likely to be very active and less of the fibrotic component. These are the things you would decide, uh, decide your injection therapy on, even if there is no flu. As uh, mentioned by Dr. Pradeep, uh, myopic CNVM uh, with a staphyloma, that kind of a scenario is a high challenge uh, doing, man we know that manual segmentation is required in many of these cases, but here it is a, an additional challenge because the lines, evaluation lines don't go through the, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 you have to be very careful in interpreting. And in your study, mostly you have followed the um, AMD CNVM patterns like Medusa head and all the looking at the biomarkers also. Mostly uh, it was similar to what is described for um, AMD. And uh, d did you see feeder vessels uh, on Octa in any of these patients? to identify the exactly i'm saying because the more resistant forms in amd have the feeder vessel whether be stefan or medusa head here you find more of these indistinct kind of tangle that you have described the interlacing pattern yeah, interlacing or indistinct or tangled pattern so here it is i i would consider multimodal imaging very important in this situation you cannot trust on octa alone i would rather do an ice ffa which also will show a leaky pattern rather than a dead tree i mean uh, in a fibrotic kind of and do it along with oct and octa very important octa alone cannot be as a quantitative car i mean that other option like yeah that is why the unlike in amd the medusa head which is more resistant your cases mostly it's indistinct or tangled pattern that's why you find fewer injections compared to amd the response also like there has a comment like very well patient symptoms also very important because visual acuity may be near normal but the patient is very sure they've got a small scotoma or a dark area in the center i think we have to look at the oct i fully agree with shobha the shrem is, I think, so if the shrem also, I mean, fibrotic, I mean, I, I mean, she, then when you, if you are an old patient of yours, and if you are seeing a shrem appearing, the octa and everything is inconclusive, definitely, most probably, it's a C. So, in, in your follow-up also, you can look into the OCT carefully, and the appearance of shrem, no other abnormality in multimodal imaging itself, I think, and the patient is symptomatic, you have to treat. This cost of you, I'm very but to be very careful. The number of injections. Uh, myopics do not need too many injections. Those. I don't. They just re sometimes respond to one thing. Exactly. We yes. come to the end of Thank the you. first session on uh, choroid. Like I would like to just highlight uh, one take home message from each presentation. The first one on chronic CSC by Dr. J. So uh, right now at the moment, like we use uh, um, a, a micropulse laser or a half lens PDT, there are upcoming options which include the brachytherapy and even probably a marijuana. And coming to acute CSC, most still believe that they won't treat at the moment. Like uh, and whether if there is a need to treat, maybe like uh, after after a period of waiting for at least two to three months, particularly in the case of a subfovea leak. Uh, then moving on to the biosimilars, Dr. Ashish Sharma made it very lucid and uh, just uh, made us believe that maybe like biosimilars are here to stay and uh, it should be accepted by most of us. So moving on to the next one, pachycroid neovasculopathy, OCTA is a very good tool in identification and diagnosis of these conditions. Uh, coming to PHCR, like it was recommended that uh, like uh, we better go with uh, the initial anti of therapy until the resolution of hemorrhage, then go with the white field angio, identify the lesion and do a good laser, like a laser which is probably more denser than what we regularly do. Regarding PCV, again, like anti of monotherapy remains the first option and a switch to or a combination of uh, PDT with PCV would be considered in cases of resistant cases. 
and uh, like regarding the 10 year follow up on uh, uh, csc changes like uh, a better look into the images would further give us some more information and uh, related to myopic cnv it's uh, it requires a multimodal imaging to be sure about the activity but always give value to patient's vision and oct the presence of uh, fuzziness in the sherm has an important indicator for activity on behalf of VRSI, I would like to thank all the panelists and all the speakers for their uh, uh, wonderful presentation and comments. Thank you all.